So what I want to do, yeah, so I'll just explain who I am. I'm a security advisor for ABG AUNZ, which is an avalanche technology group company. We're an, actually an Australian company, and we uh, we have over 50 staff in Melbourne. We have a local support, so we're local, not the Sydney side of perhaps, but, but local in Australia and New Zealand, um, we, and then we have a support centre. So um, we are the partner for ABG in, uh, Technologies, which is an international company that provides antivirus and internet security um, software. So what I want to do is talk to you uh, tonight just about uh, a little bit about who we are, a little bit about who ABG Technologies is and what we're about, give you some insight into some of the cybercrime issues that we currently face and some of the real threats that end users are actually encountering. Uh, in the wild, which is the term we use, and then I want to give you five top tips for securing your business. And there are many things I could be, many lots of tips I could be giving you, and I've just picked sort of top, five top ones, which are quick, simple, easy things that you could do in your own business to um, to get some value out of out of tonight's presentation. So first of all, I just want to talk about who uh, we're focusing on in terms of uh, being a community. Um, so what we do is at ABG, we look at uh, various mem members of the community and we, we like to um, protect as many members as we can and there tends to be two groups um, of people that um, are quite vulnerable and one of the reasons why we, we like to protect uh, people in the community is because the growth of malicious computer code you can see is quite extraordinary. Um, so in terms of um, who our most vulnerable members of our community are online, this is uh, Josh. He's a 10-year-old. He's a son of a friend of mine, and he's already got a Facebook profile. Now, I don't, I don't make any judgments about whether that's right or wrong at that age. Certainly, it's against the Facebook policy, which, is, uh, which says that you must be 13 years or older. Did you know that? 13 years or older to use Facebook. So we did some uh, research uh, throughout last year. Uh, it was broken up into the four quarters of last year and we looked at the evolution of uh, a child starting in the womb actually and moving right through to the tween period which is the ages 10 through to 13. And we had some really interesting research around the tweens especially. You know, two thirds of them are using text messaging on a regular basis. 80% uh, of them are using gaming consoles like Xboxes or Xboxes. I like that, uh, that clip. Um, and they're, you know, and about a quarter of them, even from the ages of 10 to 13, are using um, social uh, media technologies, a bit like Josh here. So, um, what we like to do is just look at that age group because these are the next, you know, this is the next generation that's coming through. And if we can get an understanding about how they're using the technology, we can start to put things into play now that are going to improve their chances of, of having a secure future online and not being so much affected by cybercrime and some of the other things that we're seeing. So it's, it's an area of, of, of really sort of passionate interest for us and just about trying to make the world a bit of a safer place online. The next group that we look at are mature generations. Uh, this is a, a picture of my 72-year-old father-in-law and when he's not posting messages on his Facebook page, well, he, he posts birthday greetings for other people on his own wall and other people never see it. Um, <laughs> And so when he's not doing that, I'm, I'm at his house, um, often uninstalling rogue toolbars that he has no idea how they got there. Uh, and, you know, it's a very common uh, story that we hear. So we've got, you know, the other thing too about um, cybercrime and, and what we see happen here is that um, just in our real lives, um, there are vulnerable members of our society. It tends to be the young and the elderly. It's the same thing online. There's nothing really special about being online. Our cyber lives are very much sort of affected by the same sorts of things. So when we're vulnerable offline, we tend to be, these same groups of people tend to be vulnerable uh, online as well. Um, so what I want to do is just to talk to you a little bit about some of the major threats that are happening right now. Um, so there's, and these are sort of things that will happen throughout this year, we think. So. Um, I won't go into too much sort of technical detail, but there's these things called exploit toolkits that are out there. And uh, these, these are sort of this, uh, the main one that we see is a thing called Black Hole Exploit Toolkit. And it was engineered by um, a Russian author, as best we can determine. And it gets sold on the underground market to um, cyber criminal 
uh, groups for about $1,500 US a copy. And this is actually a piece of malicious software that the bad guys use to push threats out to um, innocent victims who are surfing the, the web. And the way it works is it infects, um, it gen they generally compromise a web server. So as an end user, what you would do is you just be clicking on a link, going, you know, Google, you Google something, you see the, the, um, the thing you want to click on, you click on the link, you go to a website, and instead of getting what the webmaster has, you know, should, what should be there, you get, um, you get an interaction with one of these black hole toolkits. And what it basically does is when your computer sends the request to get that particular web page, in that request, your computer reveals a little bit of, about of, a little bit of information about what operating system you're using and what browser you're using. And this is the same for any computer, whether it's Linux or Windows or Mac, uh, and any type of browser. There's a thing called a user agent string. So the black hole toolkit knows what you're using. So it might know, okay, this is a request coming in. The person on the other end is using Windows 7 and they're using uh, Internet Explorer 9. So it has a database. Um, and it knows what exploits or what vulnerabilities had previously been discovered in that combination of software. And it's able to then deliver back to your computer the, the right type of exploits that are hopefully going to um, cause um, you know, either a code injection or something that you're on your end, which is going to drop some malicious software into your machine. And that's where we go down the list um, with the next two items. The, what we what we often see get dropped onto an end user's computer as a result is fake antivirus. That, that's something that our Melbourne support team encounters on quite a regular basis. And then the, another thing that we've reported um, internationally is an emerging thing we, we're calling ransomware. And I've got an example of that as well. So I'll, I'll do those in a minute. I'll show you exactly what they are. The other thing we see are mobile rootkits and rogue apps. Um, Mobile phones that are particularly vulnerable to this are Android um, phones, and that's mostly because they're a target. You know, one of the one of the things with cyber crime is that cyber criminals do do two things. They only well, they only work in one of two ways. They want the maximum return for their effort, and they want to ha have it be the least amount of effort that they can that they can do it with. So they this this is how they work, right? So basically, the the when you, the thing is with um, vulnerable software on, on mobile phones, Android is the most popular platform, so that's why it's targeted. The same with why our software exists on the Windows platform, because it's the most popular platform that everyone uses. So it's the biggest target. Um, so with mobile phones, um, you know, there's a few things you can do there to protect yourself that I can talk about later. Um, the other thing we see from our um, call centre in Melbourne is um, we hear a lot of stories of Microsoft call scams. And this can be, this is sort of an offline thing, I suppose, where you get a telephone call from someone reporting to, you know, pretending to be from Microsoft. Has anyone had a call like that? Yeah, we've got quite a few of them. We're seeing this all over the country. And it's just sort of, you know, obviously the, the, they're either war dialing phone numbers, you know, just going, trying a phone number, adding one to it, trying it again until they call people. Or they've, they've probably got hold of telemarketing databases and whatever, and they're making these calls and pretending that you've got a problem on your computer. And we've had some people sort of covertly try and follow the scam all the way through. And basically what happens at the end is they want you, they want to get remote access to your PC. Uh, and then, the, then there's a number of other things they can do. The sad part is that most of the people who make those calls, and you may not realise this, most of the people who make those calls from those call centres have no idea they are participating in a scam. Is that a surprise to anyone? So they're, they're outsourced agencies that are being employed by scammers who are making these calls, and, the act and that's why these people get very angry at you, because they're just doing their job, and, and they think, and they're even told that, oh, no, 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 um, there's other people who do this and, and they think it's a scam, so, you know, it's just a, a bizarre situation. The next one we see is um, Telstra phishing emails. This is actually a hot one um, that I wanted to show you tonight, which is just in the last 48 hours. I've got a sample here that came through. Um, and this is a, just a really good example of what to sort of look for. So one of the things we see in these types of emails that you should always be wary of, what, what is wrong with this email? First up, can anyone tell me? Click here. Click here, by clicking here maybe. There's something really obvious, yes? It's, it's mentioning Telstra and BigPont together. Yes, yes. The, the logo? Similar? What's wrong with the logo? It's an old 
Is the, how about the shape of the logo? It look a bit, just looks a bit off, doesn't it? And this is one of the things we often see. There's usually clues here, if you know what to look for. And in this case, the Telstra logo itself is just sort of completely out of proportion. It's sort of quite tall and skinny. And then this link, if you actually, I don't have it here, but if you, oh, well, maybe I do actually. Oh no, it's a screen snapshot, I don't. Um, the thing you want to do when you get an email like this and you're not sure, is to always roll your mouse over a link and make sure that, so usually in Outlook or whatever mail reader you're using, um, you'll see a, a bar that runs across the bottom of your screen. And when you roll over a link, you'll see the link that that would go to. And so what you want to do is make sure the start of that link starts, in this case with Telstra.com or whatever. In this case, what was sitting behind that link was a, a web address that was like, it was just random letters.com forward slash and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, yes? Um, how would they have sent that from a subdomain of the actual Telstra website? You can send an email from any domain you like. So the master or something? Sorry? Like, is it masked? Yeah, they're just masked. There's no, there's no security in emails. Emails can just be spoofed all the time and sent from any server you like. The only thing that can stop it at a receiving mail server end is things like um, SPF, Sender Policy Framework, and there's domain keys. And there's a couple of other things that are sort of on the way technically that businesses will adopt. Um, so, but at the moment, you know, email is quite open. One of the fortunate things, if anything, is that these sorts of emails and spam in general is actually on a decline globally. And part of the reason for that is because the scammers have moved somewhere else. Anyone want to guess where they've moved to? Facebook. So we've seen a global drop in spam because, and we've seen a ramp up in, in, in Facebook. And you might have come across some of these, you know, look what his ex-girlfriend did, you know, and there's some dodgy uh, thumbnail of a video clip, you know, and so a lot of people are sorely tempted to click on these. They're using social engineering techniques to, to get people to do these sorts of things. Um, so I'm just going to keep moving on. Um, how are we going for time, by the way? <coughs> okay, great. So. Um, fake antivirus, I just wanted to give you a quick heads up on what this actually looks like. Um, it's uh, really uh, just a sort of a, a way of these, the crooks getting money out of you. Um, so basically what happens is you would, the, the way this works is you would visit a website um, with, a, with a computer that isn't up to date, and I'll get to a, one, of the, one of my tips is to keep your computer up to date. So you, you'd visit a website, your computer's not up to date, there's a vulnerability there on your system, and you get infected with, with a fake antivirus. Now it's fake because because it will tell you you need to do a system scan, it'll pop up and pretend that it's found all these things on your computer and none of them exist, it's, it's just completely bogus. Um, some of the things they actually can do is give you a fake blue screen of death on Windows. And so this is a real example of one. And it actually, if you look, it says that paragraph here, it says, Windows detected unregistered version of antivirus 2010 protection on your computer. If problem, you know, in the English, the English is always a clue. If problem continue, please activate your antivirus software to prevent computer damage and data loss. So, so this is one of the things that uh, that we've seen there. Um, other NAG screens that pop up are things like this. You know, warning, 45 infections found. This one, Security Shield, is probably the one we hear most about at the moment in a, from our support team, um, and it can be quite tricky to get rid of. Um, funnily enough. The, the scammers who make this stuff, um, they, they, so they nag you to pay and then you eventually pay, you give them your credit card details um, and they give you a license key. That license key is the same for everyone around the world. And if you get that, so, so sometimes our support partner will, will give out the, the fake license key to get rid of it without having to pay. So it's kind of funny, we're pirating dodgy software. It's just a really weird concept. Um, the next thing is ransomware. Um, and this is something that we've seen out of Europe, um, and this is an example, a New Scotland Yard example. And so what's happened here is the web servers that have been originally compromised, that have, that have been handing out this um, malware onto infected machines, have been pornographic websites. And so the victims who've been affected by this have been people who've actually been accessing a pornographic website. And so this thing gets installed on their machine, it pops up this message it blocks access to their computer. They can't do anything else. They can't get rid of this screen. Every time they reboot their computer, it just comes up to this screen. It's all they can do. And it will only let them click on the, the buttons and things that, that will click payment. And what it says is, 
you know, um, you've been detected accessing pornographic material, etc., etc. Your IP address, we've covered the, the, the uh, private details here. Um, your IP address is this, um, you know, and you just have to pay and the matter will be resolved, you know, go away. So they're making it look like the, the law and, you know, law, legal um, profession has caught up with you and, and, and that this will go away in just a payment, that's it. So it's just a digital extortion attempt. Um, and when you think of the evolution of what the bad guys are doing, building something like this at, from a software engineering point of view is a lot easier than having to build fake antivirus which has timing loops and has to pop up messages and nag you and all sort of stuff. So from an engineering perspective, it's much easier to, to make something like this. And that's why we see it. So I just want to finish with five top tips to secure your business. The first one is always apply software updates. We, we bang on about this all the time. It is absolutely the most critical thing you can do. The, our Department of Defence, the Directorate of uh, Signals Directorate, put out a list of 34 things that all businesses could be doing. This is like the number one thing. It's just apply software updates. If you've got any fear about updating your, your computer, just do it because you, you'll be safer every time you do. The next thing is um, obviously to prevent viruses and malware. So um, you know, we've got some software obviously there. Um, with um, ABG Internet Security, you can talk to me more about that outside if you're interested in that. Um, you know, I, and I look, I'm sort of, we've got a free edition as well, um, and you know, it's just, just a recommendation, you should be running an internet security solution, because if you're not, and your computer isn't up to date fully, then you're, you're putting yourself at risk by, by getting things come in. The next thing is to secure your wireless networks. So who's got a, secure, a, a wireless network in, in, like in your, your office or your home? And, so what you want to do there is just make sure that the type of encryption you're using, and this is often you, know, you log into your router, you go into this, the configuration and just try and work out what the settings are. And you want to never use WEP, W-E-P. It can, you can crack that in like five minutes. So if someone wants to get onto your network, they could do that really easily. Um, the thing to check for your encryption type should always be WPA or WPA2. Um, that's sort of the generic advice, but there's some sort of sub-options that may be there, but um, you can always let us know if you need specific help with that. Um, so the other thing too is some routers have um, the ability to have a, a thing called a demilitarized zone, a special part of your network which is only available for guests when they visit. That can be highly recommended as well. Um, and yeah, and your encryption key should be quite long and detailed as well for your wireless network. The fourth thing is um, securing mobile devices. Who has a PIN number on their tablet or smartphone? Yeah, only a few. So if you've got a smartphone, you absolutely should have a PIN number to unlock it when you use it. If you don't, you're putting yourself at risk. If you lose that device and someone gets on there, they've got access to all your information. The other thing that you should look at is that there are features available to track a lost or stolen device using GPS. On an iPhone, it's Find My iPhone. On an Android, um, there's some other products. We've got one called ABG Mobilation. And um, you can also remote wipe the device if it gets lost as well. So that's important to, to look at. The last tip is securing your uh, business bank accounts with two-factor authentication. This is really critical for business banking. You talk to your business manager, sorry, your banking manager, about getting a solution for your company accounts that ha have you authorised transactions using two-factor authentication, which is a token device, like these ones here on the right. Is anyone using something like that now? Good. Okay, that's great. There's a, like about half of you are doing that already, so that's excellent. Um, the reason why you want to be doing this is because this is an absolute, almost foolproof measure that is going to secure your company accounts because if something, if you do get a breach somewhere in your business and something does get through and someone does have access to your systems, the last thing you want them to do is get into the, to your banking system. So this is um, a physical security device which only you've got in your possession. It's separate to your computer, so it can't it can't be interfered with in that way. So that's um, one of the things I like to tell business um, business people. So thank you, and uh, I hope I haven't gone for too long.